we just, we so deeply want to be seen and loved. And, and some of us have even forgotten that we want that. We haven't even let ourselves want that anymore mm-hmm. because it's buried so deep because of the pain that we're harboring. And, and ultimately I, I aim to help people just see that a lot of those defenses and those walls and the, those guards, they were there for a reason. Mm-hmm. And if we want to experience fulfilling love in this lifetime, we have to find a way to make peace with our past. Hello, beautiful bluebirds, and welcome back to another episode of Deja Blue. I am so excited. I say this at the beginning of most podcasts. I'm really excited, but I do. I am really excited about today's uh, episode and today's guest. It is actually the first time ever, ever meeting this magnificent woman, even though I have been adoring her online um, for quite some time, which seems to be the theme these days of how we meet each other is, uh, is through the World Wide Web and the magical jungle of Instagram. However, this woman has entered into my life in such an inspirational way in the sense of the wisdom and the depth in which she shares her care and her reverence, as well as her expanded knowledge around certain very small pieces of uh, nuggets of wisdom that can actually shift our day and ultimately our lives. And so she's really, really, really the epitome of utilizing media as medicine. And not only is she utilizing media as medicine, but she is also deeply medicine herself. She is walking medicine just from being able to meet you. Um, And simultaneously, she is the founder of Rising Woman, which has just about 2.4 million followers uh, online, as well as around 30,000 women have gone through her program. Um, And so you're really, really, really making an impact and different in creating ripples and waves. And she is now an author as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of this incredible book called Becoming the One, which we're going to talk about today um, and really just get to know um, Shalina, Ayana more and get to peel back the layers of your story and for the medicine of who you be. So thank you so much Mm -hmm. for joining me today under the cherry blossom tree in the goddess hands Mm -hmm. um, and coming to my home and being able to do this podcast in person. We just so happen to overlap our dates of you being here and me being here and it's just such an honor to have you here so thank you thank you thank you yeah thanks so much for having me I'm so excited to meet you finally I felt such a resonance with your energy the moment I saw you I was like who is this woman I have to meet her so I'm so happy that we're here together and that our little puppies get to meet and play (laughs) it's the best right like um uh, you brought Bodhi your little fur baby boy and I've got Lily my little fur baby girl and um it was love at first sight by the side by the scenes of things um, and actually, as we speak right now, Lily is demanding to leave the room so that she can go <laughs> hang out with him, <laughs> which makes me so happy because I feel like our dogs are an energetic extension of ourselves. Mm, and um, when they do, 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 do connect, I'm like, mm-hmm. feels good. Mm-hmm. So you're not in LA for very long. Mm-hmm. Um, when do you leave? Uh, in about a week. Okay. So yeah. we've got you just for a little bit and yeah. you're recording your audio I book. Am. I am recording my audio book, doing a little podcast circuit before the book goes live. Wow. Okay. So let's dive right into it. Yeah. Um, I haven't unfortunately been able to read the book yet. However, this is definitely the next on my list because I have been able to flick through it, through it and mm-hmm. I already feel such a deep resonance with the wisdom that has shared while giving context to the emotions that I haven't been able to name. Mm. And I believe that in life, context for what we're experiencing is everything to allow ourselves to not create this narrative that there's something wrong with us. Absolutely. And so before we even go into the book, I'd love to hear a little bit about your story because Mm. I'm curious, how does somebody create such a body of wisdom (laughs) um what has it taken and then this could be quite like a broad brushstroke of a question but what has it taken from you sort of being plopped onto this planet Mm -hmm. and be like right figure it out to then birthing a body of text like this that actually allows others to feel a sense of freedom in their emotion Mm -hmm. what is a little bit of your journey to get Mm -hmm. to this point Mm -hmm. well first thank you thanks for seeing me and, and acknowledging that For me, it's been a journey since birth. Truly, it's almost as if my soul came here to experience virtually every trauma you could experience and then transmute that 
into medicine, really. And so very, very early on, you know, when I was, I was born with ever out ever meeting my father, uh, my mom struggled a lot with mental illness and severe trauma from her history. And so by the time I was three, I had been in and out of foster homes and dealing with a lot of neglect and you know, being home alone a lot. And by the time I was 12, I was essentially a street kid. So I was out on the streets with kids that were at least five, some 10 years older than me, you know, drinking a lot, doing drugs, smoking, everything. So 16 years old, out on my own, working two jobs, homeschooling myself, 19, super abusive relationship. I'm lucky to have survived. Uh, and around age 21 started to wake up. And you know, there's so much more in there, of course, like we could unpack it for years, but ultimately when I was 19 in that relationship, in that abusive dynamic, there was a moment for me where I looked in the mirror and I just had this download that this was my work in the world. And I saw myself actually speaking on stage to women about re relationships and about enduring toxic relationships and abuse and really finding our power. And of course that was, you know, way way down the road, but it was like very early on where I just felt, you know what, these experiences, they're here to teach me something. And so it's almost as if I've had this capacity to endure my experiences while also knowing that it's not about me. And I don't say that in a bypassing way, like I was able to really go in and feel and process those things and really validate them for myself while also knowing that I'm really guided, you know, I'm, I'm guided by spirit. I'm guided by something greater. And deep down, I believe my soul chose this. And I've had so many conversations with my mom because she's, you know, she's in her fifties. She lives in a care home. You know, I, what I experienced is that she essentially lost her chance at having a life because of her trauma mm -hmm. and she'll express guilt or things like that. And I always just say to her, I feel like our souls really chose this. And I don't want you to ever feel guilty or like something is wrong or that, Things should have been different because I really needed all of these experiences in order to be here and to do the work that I'm here to do. And I love what I do. I love it. And so it's just such a gift, you know, that she gave me in, in this incarnation. So that's sort of what led me here. You know, I have to do this work because my history of being a survivor and being a runner and having a guarded heart made it so that relationships are challenging for me you know, being intimate in a relationship and surrender, they don't come easy. It's a lifelong practice. And so I really love working with and connecting with people in that space who maybe are struggling to let love in or are struggling to let love happen for them, because I think that's really the core of our existence. Like it's all we take with us, our life lessons, our soul lessons. It's so refreshing to hear your story in the aspect of the alchemical process that you have decided to be the embodiment of because mm -hmm. ultimately I feel like really what it comes down to is we have two choices inevitably we're dealt all of us are dealt yes. certain cards um, in our life um, whether it is abusive relationships or um, uh, disconnected with our father or whatever it may be mm -hmm. however from hearing your experience, what you've chosen to do as opposed to become the victim of it is to actually say, hey, I can alchemize this into something beautiful. I can alchemize this into my service to the planet, into my whole. Yeah. And so this is why I feel like the pages of this book and the words, the frequency behind the words ultimately are so true mm -hmm. and, and resonate so deeply because it genuinely comes from a deep level of empathy of understanding. Mm -hmm and the alchemical process of turning it into gold. Mm -hmm. um, what for you was the shift to say, I'm not a victim of this. This mm -hmm. is something that I'm actually going to utilize in my service to the planet. Mm -hmm. There was many different moments in my life where I felt called to service, where I always, I wanted to help other people almost to the extent where maybe when I was younger, it wasn't healthy. Mm -hmm. Like when I was 14, I really wanted to be a psychologist. Mm -hmm. And I actually had this epiphany when I was 14. I was like, oh, like I'm, I've been raising my mom for my whole life. You know, I, I need to actually give to myself. So I'm not going to go down that path. Um, and I think for a long time, I sort of knew that I had been through some stuff, but I didn't really acknowledge it. 
until I was in my mid twenties and I married somebody very kind of impulsively. We had been together for many years, but they were from another country and we needed basically to stay in the same country together. So we just got married, even though our relationship was not good. And we were both so young and immature. Um, But that relationship was very much just a mirror of both of our wounds. It was, we were projecting mother onto each other all the way. And when that relationship ended, it ended in betrayal. And so I, all of a sudden lost everything. Like my soul cat at the time she ran away or got taken by coyotes, which was just devastating. Um, My business, everything got taken away. I lost all of my money. My health crashed. I, I gained like 30 pounds in a month just from stress. I had all my hormones tested. I had nothing, nothing left except for cortisol. Like my whole body just went into panic mode. Uh, and I remember this moment where I just realized, you know what, this is not about him. This is not about that relationship. And I just kept getting this flood of when I was little and I was dropped off at a foster home in the middle of the night. And I realized that this was my past really coming back to haunt me, so to speak. You know, it was repeating this feeling of betrayal and abandonment and not being enough. Like all of it was just coming back. And it was strange because even though I was in so much pain and I was at like on my knees at rock bottom, I also felt so relieved in that moment. It was like, oh, thank goddess, this is not about them. This is about me, which means that I have the power to get myself out of this. And I don't need them to do anything in order for me to be okay. I don't need them to change. I don't need them to come back. I don't need them to tell me that I'm enough. And uh, so I just went down the rabbit hole and I was like, I'm not going to date. I'm not going to say yes to any invitations. I'm just going to work on myself. And I did transpersonal therapy, shadow work, breath work, every medicine, plant medicine you can imagine, ceremonies every week, uh, just everything for about seven months straight. <laughs> and then and then I met Ben, which was such a fast mm-hmm. meeting. Um, and some of that is in, in the book too. But it was really at that moment where I realized how much my past was playing a role in my present reality and how much my relationship patterns were rooted in the fact that I had never processed all of that childhood pain. Mm-hmm. You know, people would say, oh, you've been through so much and they hear my life story and they're like, how are you not, you know, struggling with addiction and living on the streets. And I would just say, oh, I'm fine. I just dealt with it. But that wasn't true. I hadn't dealt with it at all. I was just suppressing it. And then in relationship, I was kind of a nightmare. Like I wasn't vulnerable. I wasn't able to really be intimate. I wasn't really that willing. So it was just a real wake up call, you know? And then that's where this passion that I've always had for writing, you know, since I was three years old and could hold a pen really came out. And I just started writing and sharing. And then over the years, my audience grew and, and then eventually it became something bigger than me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's so potent, the overarching theme here with it, it, with the title of the book, Becoming the One. And I think sometimes from, you know, maybe a different lens, it could be like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, the the one in the sense of I'm going to find my one. I'm yeah. going to find the one in my life. But you open up the book talking about um, how you don't necessarily believe in the one, but more so this book is an invitation to become the one, recognizing that we are going to attract partners that mm-hmm. trigger us in all the right mm-hmm. areas just for our specific soul's evolution to bring awareness into the areas of our life that we're not fully um, integrated into wholeness yet. Um, and so this, um, the notion of utilizing the mirrors of our relationship to understand ourselves in a much deeper way is actually create the creator consciousness as opposed to victim consciousness. Yeah. Um, I opened it to also the part about um, the, re- the different forms of sort of shutting down or the reaction, uh, the, the, um, uh, the rejection um, tendencies and the way mm-hmm. that you'd like mapped it out. If you have a wound of rejection, Mm -hmm. this is how you can usually respond in partnership. And I was just like in the sauna this morning, like, oh, oh." (laughs) she's talking to my soul here. (laughs) Like I really have 
like you said, you know, the rabbit hole just doesn't end and there's just a never ending wellspring of information that we can find about psychology and the, yeah. the understanding of the map of, the, of human consciousness. Um, how did you, how did you be able to create context for these different responding patterns of mm-hmm. um, if there is a wound of rejection, this is how it can show its face mm-hmm. in re- reaction to, to relationships. Like how did you understand the context for these so mm-hmm. that you could word them the way that you have? Mm-hmm. It was a great question. I mean, a lot of it just really, I can't explain a lot of things just sort of land in my body. If you're familiar with human design, I'm a six two. Uh-huh. Um, so there's like something there where if I'm just like walking in the forest, this whole teaching will just drop in. I'm like, oh, cool. Um, So there is an element of that. And a lot of it is also, you know, I have worked with a lot of people over the years, you know, I've 30,000 people that have taken my programs. And also I am no walk in the park. So I have been through it, right? Um, So experience uh, working with groups. I used to run women's groups for a long time. Um, I've engaged in transpersonal therapy group programs as well, where we get to sort of process together and share you know our different responses and so I've just sort of seen it all you know in the different ways that our defense is expressed and ultimately the truth is is that pretty much everything is expressing as a way to protect ourselves like regardless of how it comes out or what our you know defense mechanism is it's all protection for our tender hearts you know we just we so deeply want to be seen and loved and and some of us have even forgotten that we want that. We haven't even let ourselves want that anymore mm-hmm. because it's buried so deep because of the pain that we're harboring. And and ultimately, I I aim to help people just see that a lot of those defenses and those walls and the, those guards, they were there for a reason. Mm-hmm. And if we want to experience fulfilling love in this lifetime, we have to find a way to make peace with our past. And to move through to write a new story, I mean, that's what this is all about. Because I, f- I feel like it's so easy to go into a relationship, notice a pattern that comes up, and then just tell ourselves that something's wrong with us, and it's we gaslight ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's just like a blanket statement, and then almost it's either it's easier to just walk away from the relationship because then they don't have to pick at that point, and it's just easier to be off in the world without someone constantly like nudging it. Um, or telling ourselves that there, there's just something wrong with us and that's just, just the way that we are and without actually being in a deeper exploration of being able to actually free ourselves yeah. from the the mental and slavery in which we have created around um, a narrative based off of just hurt and not knowing how to process it at the time. Hey, Boney! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Aww! <laughs> So this is this is the uh, the legend himself, um, your fur baby. Um, I fall in love instantly with this um, Zen Buddhist monk um, incarnated as Bodhi in this lifetime. Oh, Bodhi! Can you can you just just as a little bit of a side um, tell me? Can you can you just tell me what you shared about his past life? Like uh, the, the, the um, with the with the ball. Oh yeah. yeah. So my husband and I always joke that he's reincarnated Zen master because he's just he's the most chill dog. Like we'll go to a park and there will be this really anxious dog and it'll be barking in his face for I'm not kidding like 10 minutes and Bodhi will sit and he'll just stare at them and he'll just wait and then eventually they'll start playing and we get from owners all of the time we get owners that are like my dog doesn't play with other dogs this is so weird Uh, and we're like oh he has like a magic touch and but we joke that he came back with one final attachment which is ball (laughs) obsessed ball and stick he just he loves it can't get enough well, he's the cutest <laughs> and um, I'm so yes. happy that he's made a little debut. If you're listening to this on audio, then what's <laughs> happening right now is Bodhi has jumped on onto her lap and um, <laughs> is making his uh, his debut moment and uh, allowing us to be bask in his Zen Buddhist <laughs> energy and aura. <laughs> yeah, he's he's definitely a soulmate of mine. Oh, I can yeah. tell. <laughs> Bash, fur babies are the best. <laughs> they really are. Anywho, um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your your program, you know, you said 30,000 people. Yeah. That's not a small yeah. amount of women that have gone through your program. I'm super curious about what does it entail and what does the process look like? Mm. And is it still running? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So becoming the one is my, you know, my program. And then I had the book, which I was like, okay, I'm going to write the book now. Um, and in some ways they're very similar, but they're also completely different energies. Becoming the one program is really 
the process that I went through, that I was sharing with you when I went through my own awakening, when I was at my rock bottom and I realized like, oh, I'm responsible for all my relationship patterns. And oh, I was blaming my partner for all of these things, but actually look at how I was showing up. And it's like I had to take ownership for all of the things that I had been pushing outside of myself for so long. So there was a lot of deep accountability work that I had to do in that process. <laughs> I <didn't> agree. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it was not easy, you know, because it was like this whole time I had been almost using my partnerships or my, you know, relationships that I would go into as a way to hide from myself. And so when I created this program, it was rooted in all of the practices that I had designed for myself as a container to take myself through while I was, you know, doing the ceremonies and going to therapy and, and doing all of that intense work. So I created processes for myself. And um, eventually, you know, like I said, I met Ben about seven months in and we negotiated our relationship agreement from the start that we would be in a conscious relationship. And it was all very intentional. And so when I created Becoming the One, I'm essentially taking people through the process that I had to go through, right? Like what are our relationship patterns and, and where do they come from? And what's our relationship to our past and to our, our parental figures and how are they showing up in our present day reality? Mm-hmm. Um, and then we move through the process of clarifying what are your core values? Mm-hmm. Because this is something that most people don't ask before they enter relationship, right? We just kind of... We just kind of fall into relationship instead of intentionally saying, this is what I want. This is who I am. And this is what I stand for. And this is what I want to co-create. Are you in, Mm -hmm. you know? And so a lot of times we end up in partnerships where we can almost not even call them a partnership because it's not even a real team and the values just don't align. Or maybe, you know, we value physical touch and there's good chemistry, but that's the only value that's there. And so I take people through this process of uncovering their true core values and what really guides them in their lives and what they want to guide them in relationship so that when they get to the point of meeting somebody, they have that as a compass. Uh, And then we do love mapping process, which is something that I did before I met Ben. And I wrote down all of the things that I wanted to feel and experience and what our partnership would be like. Um, And I wrote down some very specific things. So one of the things that I wrote down was that I would like to have a partner who does not drink, like at all. I don't drink. It's a part of my reality that I just don't, I don't want present. And so I remember telling a friend at the time uh, and he said, well, what if it's just like one or two drinks every once in a while with his buddies? You know, like that's, it's not realistic. And I said, well, if he has a drink every once in a while with his buddies, then I don't want to date him because I want to be with a partner who doesn't drink. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that's too crazy to ask for. Um, And he's like, well, that's going to like really shrink the pool down. And I was like, that's good because I only need to date one person. (laughs) So, (laughs) and, and, you know, it's just so funny because, you know, when I met Ben, um, he had gone through rehab when he was 15, which was very, very young. And, you know, he hadn't drank for over 20 years and it was just, like there was little things and I was like, right, write that down. If there's something very specific and you're afraid to write it down because you think it's asking for too much, then you should write it down. Mm-hmm. And so we go through this process of really reclaiming the relationship to ourselves, like being in relationship with ourselves as the foundation. Mm-hmm. And then knowing that, you know, we're already whole. And then when we call in a partner, it's as a whole person, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's sort of the the program. And then the book is a deep dive into all of that plus more into a re-education on relationship and all of the things. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot, lot to chew on here, Mm -hmm. a lot to really integrate (laughs) and marinate on. Um, I'm curious, what would other core values look like to you? So you you talked about, you know, someone that doesn't drink, but um, just for for people that are listening that are going, oh, I I didn't create my core values with my partner. This is a really important topic. Um, What would, what would, be some core values as an mm-hmm. example. Yeah. Well, generosity. Mm-hmm. Generosity is really important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that I've always really valued. Um, honesty. Mm-hmm. And like, what does honesty actually mean to you? Integrity. You know, integrity with who we are, with others, to our word. Respect. Respect is a very important value. You know, if we don't have respect for our partners, then we don't have much. 
um, trust, you know, authenticity, um, drive. You know, some people really value creativity and open-mindedness, spirituality. There are some people who they're like, yeah, I'm spiritual, but like my partner's not and it doesn't matter to me. And you know what? That's awesome because not everybody needs to have a partner who shares the same spiritual values. However, some of us, you know, myself included, who live and breathe a spiritual path, we need a partner who's with us. And I'm sure you resonate with this. Yeah, you know? definitely. So we need to know that ahead of time. And and not everybody is the same. And so when we know our values and what, what we really need, what we stand for in life, then we can see that in others and say like, hey, this is really important to me. How do you feel about that? You know, or what's your take on, you know, living a devotional life or having a spiritual practice or, you know, how do you feel about, you know, having children, you know, family? That's a value, right? Mm -hmm. And so... If we don't know those things, then we essentially don't know who we are. And that's just the, the bottom line. And if we don't know who we are, then how can another person really know us either? And how can we qualify to know if this is really going to be a partnership where we can create together, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and we have to go through those phases where we don't know. That's, mm -hmm. that's important too. Mm -hmm. That's part of how we learn. Right, 100%. What would you say if... Um, somebody's sitting down and they're, they're getting really clear on their core values and they realize that there's a core value that, that is not, um, is not matching or cannot be met. Um, what, what sort of guidance would you share around that sort of situation? Yeah. So when we go through this process, there's sort of like a multi-layered process and there's like deal breakers, right? And then there's nice to haves. For example, when we are in a partnership, there are going to be certain core values that are absolute must-haves, right? Like for me, like, and for everyone, it should be respect, you know, honesty, integrity, mm -hmm. you know, loving each other. Um, but there are going to be other things that maybe are important to you and that are a value for you, but that you don't need to have in another partner. Mm -hmm. And so we have to kind of be careful with this one because when we go down this process of, you know, figuring out who we are and what we want, what we want to watch for is trying to make everyone the same as us because that's not what we're doing, mm. right? So there's a difference between saying, hey, it's really important to me that I have a partner who values family, who's kind, who's respectful of me and others, you know, who is, you know, hardworking versus, um, you know, they have to like all of the same, you know, things as me, they have to do the same spiritual practices as me, you know, they have to have the same, you know, way of spending money as me, like all of those things because there is medicine in the polarity too. And so it's sort of about evaluating, okay, these are the things that I need in order to feel safe and like I'm truly able to live and express myself at my highest potential. Mm -hmm. And then these are the differences that my partner can bring into my life that are here to teach me something. Right. So like for money is a really big one. Usually you get people with different money patterns. One person is a spender. One person is a saver. Usually the person who's the spender is more of an earner. Right. But then the saver can usually grow and invest and manage money more because they're a little bit more detail oriented. And that was the case for Ben and I. Right. I'm just like kind of impulsive and a spender sometimes most of the time um very abundance or oriented and and maybe not you know slowing down with all of the details and he's sort of the opposite and at first we would judge each other mm. and then we realized we're the perfect team like we're coo and ceo here in this relationship so when we come together now we have money meetings and we talk about it and i have an area of expertise and he has an area of expertise and we join them mm. and so some of those differences actually become your greatest strengths right? It's like the yin and the yang. So you just got to kind of know where to draw the line. You're, you're not going to have a partner that's the exact same as you. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I mean, this is just, yeah, really uh, powerful. You also refer to it in the book as um, the red light, the yellow light and the, the green light mm -hmm. also just around certain tendencies and patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that before even this conversation, I, I think I've seen it as like, these are my values and this is a fuck no. But I haven't mm -hmm. actually like created that space for this would be really nice. Yeah. But it's also not a deal breaker. Yes. Um, and I've seen it like the pillars of a temple. Mm -hmm. of, like you're building a temple together and then yeah. you've got these certain pillars that hold it up. 
Um, and one of the one of the pillars of of mine and Andre's temple that we really match on is to the desire and the genuine um, drive and passion to be the best version of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And in our own unique way, right? Because my best version of myself may not look like the way that 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 he is operating, but there's a drive to want to want to constantly be moving forward, and that's something that is the theme of, and the fabric of our relationship. And it, and that that conversation around core values can be a game changer mm-hmm. for people that may not have even addressed this at the beginning because of the attraction. Um, mm-hmm. I'm curious. Uh, there's you know there's this I don't know who it is that created the technology or just the 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 context of it but the the love languages mm-hmm. um and my love language is very different than Andre's mm-hmm. mine is words of affirmation yeah. and his is like quality time or yeah. acts of acts of um acts of kindness yeah or acts of service um and so with two people that have different love languages I've learned that we usually give in our love language Mm -hmm. so i'm always like oh you get it yes you're amazing oh he's so so great and look at him doing this and he's a brilliant human and he's like yeah (laughs) like i'm like down down. double down in (laughs) on the love language and then like i've created something and i'm like look babe and he's like that's amazing like just amazing Mm -hmm. like (laughs) where you at (laughs) you know but then he'll like do something like build this whole podcast set for me when i'm gone i'm like surprise me when I come home you know and I'm like you know so we give in our in our love language so I'm, I'm curious um around h- how would you navigate or give guidance towards yeah. someone that is craving for their own love language it's similar to what you said about we want sometimes I think subconsciously we want them to be like us totally. um, and then judge them when they're not I think that's yeah. probably just an extension of the conversation around the love language um, yeah. but what would you say around somebody that's, that's craving sort of the love language in which they give but it's not necessarily the default of the other. Yeah, that's such a good question. Uh, it was, I think it was Gary Chapman. He wrote the five love languages. Uh, I had, no, um, didn't know that it came from Yeah, him. and I, I think I read that book on a plane when I was in my early 20s and I loved it. It was a great introduction. And what I've found is that we have the capacity for every love language, of mm-hmm. course. And of course, we have these primary love languages. And I think the beauty of being in conscious relationship is learning how to stretch ourselves and to give those things that might not be as intuitive for us. And that's the devotional practice, right? That's the devotional practice in love is I'm going to go outside of myself here to, you know, worship at the altar of your heart. And like, what is the thing that you need? And also to keep in mind, you know, like you said, you know, he might not say all of the words in that moment, but then he does this elaborate mm. studio for you and you come home and surprise. And it's so, it's also about maturing in love and being able to do, you know, what you did was recognize, you know, sometimes my partner expresses love in this way and I'm opening myself to receive that love instead of, no, you didn't love me the way that I wanted to be loved, which is very much an inner child wound. You know, because we want to punish our partners for all of the ways that we weren't seen or hurt or loved in the past. And so we really don't let a lot of love in. And so there's also this art in allowing ourselves to see the ways that our partners are loving us, even when it's not obvious in the moment. You know, it's like assuming the best of them instead of assuming the worst. And then there's this dance of saying like, hey, you know, I love hearing words. And so, you know, In your case, as a couple, one of the things Ben and I do, and I suggest this to couples all the time who have words as their primary love language is sit in front of each other, you know, for 10, 15 minutes once a week before bed and take turns, you know, spending five to six minutes telling your partner everything you love about them, Mm -hmm. everything you appreciate about who they are, about what they do in the world, about their energy, about how you feel when you're with them. And everything you appreciate about the little things that they do in your home and in your family. And Ben and I do that all of the time. Both of us, we love words and we love touch. And so we try to make that a ritual. And we've even gone as far as we've done, you know, 30 or 60 days of every single night before bed, we tell each other three things we appreciate about each other. And, you know, that's not hard to do. You just, you commit to it as a partnership. And it might even stretch your partner who maybe words don't come as natural to become more expressive because chances are that person who isn't as expressive has a lot in there that maybe they just haven't learned how to let out Mm. in that way you know so it's like we're giving ourselves a gift as well Mm. that's a brilliant like 
practical mm-hmm. step. I suppose also, what I love about um, this book so far is that there's lots of practicality in it. There's so many ways of like, okay, this is how we diagnose it. Or this is this is the context of what's coming up based off of this wound. Yeah. And the, the, the key here to unlock it is compassion for yourself so that you can allow it to breathe. And then from that place, here are some action steps. Here are some mm-hmm. integration tools to support you with, to create a new default and a new way of operating. Um, and I think that, that I mean, this is something that you know I'd want to have on my bookshelf, super easy to just grab, mm-hmm. as more so of a book that I would keep returning to for guidance because we are on this journey through life, and the only way we're going to meet a deeper layer of ourselves is through relation, is through yes. relationships with friends, with beloveds, and we're just going to keep learning more and more and more about ourselves, and um, through tools to be able to continue to alleviate ourselves from the 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 trauma or the the suppression that has happened throughout our lives, like little pockets, like little air pockets that are just like mm-hmm. in there. Like, you know, like, like um, needing dough. Yeah. And there's like little air pockets. If there's air pockets in it, then it won't rise properly. Mm-hmm. So this is, th- this <laughs> is the journey of mm-hmm. needing the dough out so that the air pockets can be needed out. And then it, it can genuinely mm-hmm. rise in love mm-hmm. as opposed to, oh, I like that analogy. Um, mm-hmm. As opposed to sort of just, being like oh it just is the way that it is yes which yeah. can create a victim or create a consciousness mm-hmm. yeah absolutely. how i mean it makes so much sense to me now meeting you in person and just getting a feel for the glow that you be um <laughs> and the wisdom that you bestow within your being um however i'm just curious about the journey from um for rising women like mm-hmm. It just came into my life because it's just incredible wisdom that it's just little nuggets that are posted here and there. And and having a sizable audience of I mean, around 2.4 million people, that's, you put 2.4 million people in one space, you'll quickly <laughs> know how much of an impact yeah. you're making through this portal of a device. Yeah. I'm curious what the journey was from going, you know, of what you shared with your past and then having that awakening process and then starting to take ownership and then starting through your life experiences and the epiphany moments and then the student being a student of many different teachers. What was the journey to birthing Rising Woman? Yeah, it was actually such a long journey and I had it in my consciousness for years before I ever even built it. So I started buying the domains for it, you know, on a payment plan because it was an expensive domain, like in 2013, which I was still in that previous relationship that I shared that was sort of the catalyst for my awakening at the time. And I was still, I was writing at that point. I was writing empowerment, you know, poetry and things like that for women, but it was definitely coming from that maiden, that maiden energy. It was immature feminine. It wasn't this like empowered, I'm anchored in myself truth. And so I had a ways to go before I was ready. So I was just holding on to it. And I had this vision for a really long time. I knew I wanted to create a platform for women and I wanted to elevate the voices of women and I wanted them to feel seen and I wanted them to have a space to heal and to explore all sorts of things, you know, their cycles and motherhood and birth. You know, I'm a, I'm a doula as well. At that time I was engaged in birth work. And so I just really wanted to have a platform for women. Um, But it just wasn't time. And I think, you know, on a deep soul level, I knew that. And so once I went through that divorce and I went through that healing crisis, really, and everything had shattered and I was picking up the pieces and finding out just how guarded I had been and who who's underneath that, this really sensitive, very tender, very, very intuitive woman who had been hiding away because there had been too much pain in the world. When I finally met that woman, that's when I was ready. Um, and I just become more and more ready every year. It's like new layers emerge and I feel more and more myself. Uh, but it really started, I think it was like around 20, the end of 2015, early 2016. I just started, I built the website with a friend of mine and, uh, I just started writing, you know, and over a few years I was writing and writing and writing. And then, um, I created a program, uh, with a friend of mine from the past and, um, did one program through Rising Woman and, And then I built Becoming the One. And Becoming the One really was the offering of my heart and soul and the path that I walked. It was that thing that I had been through and I was ready to guide other people through that. So it really was just this journey of, you know, sharing and 
not trying to create a business right away. You know, I do have a history of, I've had another business in the past. And for me, it's always been give, 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 right? Generosity, give energy, share as much wisdom and heart as you can. And eventually it will all come back and there's no rush. And I never wanted to put pressure. Rising Woman felt like such a, an energy of itself that I think I, I waited like almost two years to offer anything for sale, like any product, because I didn't want to put any pressure on it to be about money. Mm. And I mean, now we're a seven figure business. I have a wonderful team um, of women and and men who just live and breathe this work with us. And I could not do it without them. But it was because this was meant to have a life of its own, really. Um, so that's how we got here. <laughs> There's two main pieces around that that really stand out for me is that you turned your greatest challenge into your greatest gift in your service. Mm-hmm. And it was born from passion. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it's it's got within it the seed of the frequency of your highest excitement, which according to the Gene Keys and Richard Rudd, um, anything planted with the seed of your highest excitement will always bear fruit. But mm-hmm. anything planted based off of a fair frequency, which mm-hmm. is I need to do this to make money, for yes. example, then actually it has its own demise in the intention of the seed in the in the first place yeah. so there's two re- really big pieces that stand out for me which is so deeply inspiring also with the overtone of just give yeah just give just give as much as you can and as often as you can because it's pulsing through you like you said you'd be walking through the forest and all of a sudden ding yeah. and then the next thing is because half the cycle is to receive the insight to receive the wisdom to receive the the a knowledge through life's experiences the other half of the cycle is to give it mm-hmm. otherwise stagnant energy gets it gets locked and so really? it, it to honor the cycle so that new information can keep coming through it must be shared and so the, the three pieces of of give unconditionally born from passion and um you turn your greatest challenge into your service is a recipe for for success what uh, what my truest definition ultimately every word is subjective to whatever definition you place on it however my definition of success is to do what you love that lights you up and to share it uninhibited with the world i love that that for me is like oh, today was a successful day. Mm-hmm. That and how much did I laugh today? Those yes. are my two versions of success. For sure, I love that. I love that you shared that too. I'm so curious more about the the Gene Keys wisdom because I I went down that rabbit hole a little bit and I was like, this is going to be a full time job for me. Yeah, it so is. I'm going <laughs> to just lean out of this for a little bit, but it's waiting for me. Um, but yeah, I I do believe that. I think you know, especially what you said about you know if it's coming from fear. And there's this pressure on it. You know, it's not coming from truth. And and that's the unfortunate thing I think about these times is that there's a lot of that. And so we have to be discerning, right? Is like, am I am I giving when I'm have a full cup? Am I giving because I, I just want to like give and love? Or am I trying to get something? And that's a really good teaching to take into a relationship too. Right? I tell people all the time, you know, if you're giving something right now, really check yourself. Are you giving because you want to get something back? Or are you giving because you're just brimming with abundance right now and you just want to give, you know, and can you access that? And if you really, if the answer is really no, like, no, I'm giving because I want to get something, give to yourself, you know, redirect that energy and put it toward yourself and and replenish so that you can give from a place of internal abundance so that there's no resentment between you and your partner or in your friendships and things like that. This is the 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 deeper inquiry and the deeper level of being human mm-hmm. is the question, where is this coming from? Yeah. Because um, specifically with, and I've talked about this before on the podcast, with my hearing decreasing mm-hmm. quite a lot, mm-hmm. what has actually been activated is an understanding of the frequency and where the words come from, not necessarily the words themselves and how energy never lies and words do all the time. So we can Mm. say, Hey, I want to give you this. Um, But it comes from a place of I'm giving you this because if you don't take it, I'm not, my presence is not valid in the space. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to receive it. It's almost like there's a, there's a frequency disconnect of like everything by the five senses is telling me that I should receive this. But my body is going, I feel a contraction around this. Yeah. It's because it's the sensitivity of picking up on the wounding that's actually promoting the giving in the first place, as opposed to, 
I feel so activated. I did my practice this morning. Mm. I went and moved my body. I feel <laughs> alive. The sun is out. And I made all of these things. And here's a muffin. You know, it's like, <laughs> it comes from a different place. And then yeah. all of a sudden, the person that's ingesting it is also not only re- genuinely receiving and being able to actually fulfill that person's joy because it, part of it is in the receiving too, but also the frequency of the muffin is supercharged. <laughs> that's a supercharged muffin. <laughs> I love muffin. <laughs> Supercharged <laughs> muffin. Um, and so this is the this is the rabbit hole I believe that we speak of. It's mm-hmm. like there's layers. There's layers to this experience. And the layers are very presented in relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, and then circling back in with, you know, becoming the one. This is an amazing opportunity to just dive into the complexities of why we do what we do. Mm-hmm. And how we can utilize our relationship to be the thing that actually allows us to come back into wholeness Mm -hmm. so that we are the one for ourselves. Absolutely. And then to be able to give that to other people. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so um, how long have you been been together? Uh, Just six and a half years. Just about seven years. Six and a half, seven years. Yeah. And Bodhi's been around for two two of those. So he's he's both of your babies? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we picked him out together. Oh, they're sleeping side by side. So cute. Oh. I'm so in love. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Met him at four weeks. And the moment I held him, I knew he was the guy that was coming home with us. And his name came through right away. Oh. Um, and he, yeah, we brought him home at nine weeks. And he's been with us ever since. And we pretty much just, we followed attachment parenting with our dog. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody was like, you got to put them in a kennel and like, they shouldn't sleep with you. And <laughs> we just didn't do any of that. And he's such a little Zen, Zen master. So <sighs> yeah, he's our family member. We, we love him. Uh, yeah. It's, I mean, really just like, there's nothing, I mean, maybe, a, maybe a child, um, yeah. but but outside of a child, yeah. there's nothing better than a fur baby. No. Well, and it's such a unique kind of love, right? It's different than any type of human connection. Yeah. And like you were talking about the senses, right? If you think about it, a dog can't speak back to us, right? So everything is energetic. And in a way, for me, it really showed me in the beginning when I had him, he was so sensitive to my energy. And so like if I was grumpy, you know, or I'd swear under my breath about something, he would get startled. And so I really was like, oh, I have to hold a good energy here, you know, with my, because he's reflecting. And so- I felt like he was my teacher from the beginning. And also there's just this pure unconditional love that we have with animals. Like I really believe animals can be our soulmates. Uh, And it's just different because, you know, in human relationships, like we can say things to each other that are hurtful and we have to repair it. And there's all this, you know, there's spoken word in the way sometimes, Mm -hmm. right? And the first language is energy. And so it's just such a special bond. Truly, truly yeah. beyond words. It goes back to that point. Yeah. Um, I was sharing with some sisters yesterday because I just met them for the first time um, uh, or like just getting to know them. And um, I explained a little bit more about my hearing and mm-hmm. how I'm a little bit more like one of the dogs mm-hmm. where I'll speak energy for the yeah. most part. Um, and, uh, and, and so anything in the space that is not being expressed, that is being held back, that is not being allowed to to be vocalized because of fear of how it's going to make someone else feel, mm-hmm. I'm going to feel it. And so I'd rather someone speak into it directly as opposed to me feeling it and then creating a story in my head of why I'm feeling this thing and then creating like an agitation or like an awkwardness um, and to actually just always speak into it and have that that courage to speak into the resistance of what came up as opposed to it building because you know as a greatest teachers these little animals are just they're just speaking frequency mm-hmm. yeah absolutely and what a beautiful gift for you to recognize that too in yourself and to see you know that's an aspect of you as a medicine woman that is here to invite you deeper into the energetic space yeah. you know and for people to know and honor that in you i think it's really beautiful do you want to know a fun fact mm-hmm. fun fact yeah tell me so my brother and i both were diagnosed yeah. um and my brother's a professional poker player he mm-hmm. reached people at the poker table oh really yeah <laughs> And you'll sit there, everyone's got their masks on yeah. and, you know, poker face. 
no matter what, but he yeah. can feel and read the energy mm-hmm. of the people sitting at the table. And he, yeah. he's, he's pretty successful poker player because of wow. this, this extrasensory perception that's come online based off of a decretion of one of the energies. I've gone into the realm of the, the shamanic realm. Yeah. So it's supporting with the releasing of denser energies or the transmutation of trauma or, you know, mm-hmm. certain things that are sit, sits on, sit on our body utilizing this superpower that goes beyond the five senses Mm -hmm. now i don't believe that every single person needs to lose their hearing necessarily Mm -hmm. to um to activate this but really a recognition and an invitation that there's always there's always another dimension of communication that is happening that the dogs are such an amazing reminder of for ourselves to actually um uh to 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 give it a little bit more credit to Mm -hmm. it's that intuition yeah Absolutely. Wow. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that story. That's oh, really, fun fact. yeah, that's amazing. Talked about in the, um, uh, the radiant sutras. I don't know if you're familiar with the radiant sutras. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the radiant sutra number 66 talks about how, when any, um, sense is deprived, mm-hmm. then the energy only has to go into self-discovery and inwards. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've decided to enroll into a six day, um, Six day darkness retreat in a couple of weeks. Beautiful. So just complete. Have you ever done one? No. Pitch black. Yeah. There's a bathtub and it's mm-hmm. underground. So imagine wow. like being in the earth. Yeah. In the water. Yeah. And then all senses deprived. Wow. For six days and five nights. Yeah. I mean, a lot of um, the Tibetan Buddhist masters, you know, like they they will go on dark retreats for most of their lives. Mm-hmm. I was actually my. My husband, he just sat in a, a Wichol peyote ceremony um, a couple of weeks ago. And at the end, they did this couple's flower blessing for us. And one of the uh, the Curanderos, the women, she was talking about how there's these elders that are part of the, the Mexican lineage. And when they're born, they're like chosen. They're, they have this frequency and they know that they're going to be, you know, elder shamans. And so as soon as they're born they take them into a cave in the dark. And for 20 years, they don't come out. Like 20 years, they're just in the dark. And then when they come out of the the darkness, they, they're they just completely open and they have, you know, prophecies and, and they guide. And so then the shamans, they go and they sit with them and they, they pray together. And then these elders, they guide them and they tell them, you know, here's what's going to happen in the future. And a lot of that stuff has already started happening. Uh, and so it was just really interesting how, you know, this idea of taking away some of our senses to bring us inward is, you know, so potent throughout all of these different traditions. And even if you look at psychedelic therapy, like you put a blindfold on when you're doing, you know, a psychedelic journey so you can go inward. Yeah. So there's a lot to that. Wow. Yeah. I thought five days was a long time. <laughs> oh my 20 gosh. years. I mean, it is though. It is a lot for those of us who are not going on dark retreats. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's going to be really, really transformative for you. And I'm excited to talk to you after and yeah. hear how that goes. I feel like, you know, when um, I've just seen a like Discovery Channel, those blind mole, moles that live under the ground, they come out and they're like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like they'll open the door. But yeah. I don't want to just such a creature. Yeah. Like, Maybe you won't want to come out yet. You know, you might be. Some people go for months, apparently, yeah. like one to two months. They'll just go submerge themselves into the darkness. Yeah. Um, but apparently after day three, there's no difference between your eyes being open and your eyes closed and it is a psychedelic experience. Wow. This is amazing. Yeah. Aubrey Marcus did it and that was what inspired okay. me. He did a podcast on it and I was like, oh, I'm a Scorpio. I really love yeah. descending into the underworld. Oh, you're Conch. a Scorpio. Okay. Making sense now. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, let's go yeah. into the cave. Totally. So wow. um, you did mention psychedelics and you yeah. said that you went through this journey of, um, you know, sitting with all the plant medicines. Yeah. Um, if you were to, because I mean, the plant medicines have been a very reoccurring theme. If you already know, just my little hanging <laughs> mushroom from the tree. Um, I'm curious how you found psychedelics and and specifically a uh, plant medicine in in specific. Mm-hmm. Um, how it supported your path um, in in your discovery of becoming the one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, as as cliche as it sounds, like I didn't find the medicine; the medicine found me. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of how it goes for most of us. I don't even really remember how it all came to be. I mean, I had learned about ayahuasca many years before I ever did ayahuasca, probably six or seven years. Um, 
I had seen this book about ayahuasca. I can't even remember the name of it. I think it was the cosmic serpent mm. perhaps. And I actually listened to an Aubrey Marcus podcast, like seven or 10 years ago, maybe oh. he's been podcasting for a really long a time. Long time. And I remember, you know, listening to some of his stories about ayahuasca being like, Oh, Damn, okay, I'm going to wait on that because I got a lot going on in here and I think I need to prepare more. So I actually was preparing to do ayahuasca for six years before I ever felt like I was ready. And even when I, when I, you know, felt like I was ready, I, I don't think I really was. <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, I started with, you know, doing, you know, some other medicines. I, I was doing um, medicine work with uh, this medicine called Hape. Mm-hmm. Um, I was doing Sananga, which are these eye drops. Eye drops, pr- yes. Pr- 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 eye drops. Uh-huh. Um, I was doing combo, mm-hmm. um, like frog medicine, uh, DMT, and uh, psilocybin. And and then I just had this moment when I was standing under the threshold in my house, my old house, and I just got this message from spirit. It's time to get stripped bare. Like, this is your time. It's time to go in and do ayahuasca. And then, you know, shortly after that, Ben and I met and he had already been sitting with ayahuasca about three or six times previously. And so he took me to my first ceremony, my first three nights of ceremony. Um, and we've been sitting together ever since. So um, it's been about a six year journey with us now. It's been a part of our lives. And my first three ceremonies were intense they absolutely rocked me but I, some of my greatest teachings came from those ceremonies and i share some of the stories in the book a lot of mother wound work a lot of integration with divine feminine um, a lot of healing with divine masculine because right? i had a lot of sexual trauma abandonment trauma of course and i had one ceremony night where i was on night three and i i felt like i was being tortured to be honest with you like i was really in hell i was i had relived every trauma i had relived my mother's trauma i had gone into her mental illness i had become her for a night and i was just done and i i ran out of the ceremony space i don't know how i did it because i couldn't really walk but somehow i got the strength and i ran out of the ceremony space and there's these candles lining this path to the to the house away from the ceremony space. And I went into the bathroom and I collapsed. And then I couldn't get up. And I don't know how long. I must have been in there for like an hour or two hours. And I'm laying on the floor in the bathroom. And I keep trying to get up and just falling back down. Get up, fall back down, get up, fall back down. Cannot get up. And all of a sudden I hear this noise. And this man barges in. And he was, he's from ceremony and I recognized him and he had these jaguar tattoos all over his body and he had been sitting for a really long time. And uh, somehow like that jolted me to sit up and I sat up and I just stood there, leaned against the wall, looking at him and he's looking at me and he's, you know, he's looking kind of freaky because, you know, we're both on ayahuasca and he's covered in these jaguar tattoos. And I'm just looking at him and he's looking at me and he's like, are you okay? And I was like, nope. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he's like, well, let me take you back. And I was like, I'm not going back. (laughs) I'm not going back Mm -hmm. there. And he's like, why? And I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, okay, well, let me just take you to the couch then. And there was this couch in this, in this room. And he lays me down on the couch and put covers me with a blanket and turns out the lights. And he says, I'm just going to sit here with you if that's okay. (sighs) And I feel emotional actually even sharing this story because it was so foreign to me to receive love. And this is when I'm just starting my partnership with Ben. And I still had a lot of wounds with the masculine to work out. And I said, you don't have to. And he said, it's my honor. And he just sat in the dark with me for like two hours and and just waited. And then eventually he looked at me and he said, okay, we're going back now. And I said, I'm not going back. He's like, well, I'm going back. And so you can come with me if you want. And I stood up and I held onto his arm and he escorted me back. And some, he said something that made me giggle and it like brought me a little bit back to reality. And Ben was in the ceremony space. And, you know, when you do ceremony in partnership, you're really supposed to give each other space. So you're not supposed to go after your partner. And Mm -hmm. so he uh, describes it as torture. Like he doesn't know where I am. He's like thinking he should go after me. He hears me giggling and he kind of sighs relief. And then I come back into the ceremony space and I just sort of collapse next you know, to Ben and on my mat. And then the shaman comes and gets me and I like crawl to their mats. And 
he looks at me and he just says, where's your family? And I just said, they're gone. And I just like curled up into fetal position. And, you know, one of the shamans has this gigantic drum and he's drumming over me. And my other current who I still work with today, he's singing over me. And so I have these two very powerful men like singing over me and like rubbing plants and flowers on me. And like, I can feel this sexual trauma and this like father wound coming out as they're singing. And then when it's over, the assistant is also a man and he comes to me and asks me to hold on to his arm and he walks me back to my mat and just says, are you okay? And then he leaves. And it was, it was just every way I looked, there was the masculine in service to my healing and nobody wanted anything in return. And that in itself was a healing moment for me. And so that's part of why medicine work has been so transformative. It's not even in the journey. It's all the things around the journey that really helped me integrate. Mm. It's, I mean, thank you first and foremost for sharing that experience. Um, It's such a deeply vulnerable space to be in the ayahuasca space and to be sharing it publicly here on the podcast. And simultaneously, it is a reminder that, you know, people say it's the back door to consciousness and and ultimately, I think that that can create a blanket statement that it's easy and that yeah. it's it's just, oh, we'll just go off and get high. But realizing <laughs> you are consciously deciding to drink a medicine that is going to sometimes ruthlessly show you what it is that's actually actually inhibiting yeah. you from embodying the light and what are the blockage that didn't actually even start with us. Yeah. But it is our responsibility to transmute it for our future generation of our children that we potentially have. Mm-hmm. And also I've always noticed in the medicine space that the medicine weaves through other people in the space too. So right now in that yeah. moment was to 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 release your, you know, the, the trauma around your relationship with the masculine and the men yeah. specifically. Um and how the men were showing up for you in the space through service and and that brother, the medicine was weaving through that brother too that mm-hmm. went and became a safe space for you in a selfless service of, I'm just, it, and even just hit the line that it said, it's my honor. Yeah. Because it's specifically very difficult to receive mm-hmm. that support when there's a block around that specific piece. Yeah. But for him to say, it's my honor, mm-hmm. breaks that mm-hmm. and says, it's my honor to mm-hmm. sit with you while you go through a transformational experience of, of releasing what isn't serving you anymore. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you, Grandma Ayahuasca, for your guidance. Yeah. And, um, and I just, you know, I feel like books are such an incredible way to condense all of one's life's experiences and all of the wisdom and all of the ceremonies and all of the teachers and all of the times where you've been face down in the dirt. Like, yeah you know, metaphorically naked or yeah. maybe even Literally. actually <laughs> naked. Like, releasing, releasing, crying to the point where mm-hmm. like just, just not everywhere. Like th- this is the stuff that we don't see behind the Instagram <laughs> and, uh, and, and and even the podcast and, you know, we put them on nice outfits yeah. and all of the things. Um, but it's real. Mm-hmm. And the world is starving for real. Mm-hmm. And I believe that's why you will always continue to be successful in whatever way that looks like to you because you're real Mm -hmm. and you've spent a lifetime and many lifetimes carving out what real feels like Mm -hmm. and one of my teachers says I don't know what the truth is but I know what love feels like Mm -hmm. and it is just constantly reminding us to just okay, this is what love feels like. All right, I'm going to keep chipping away. Anything that doesn't feel like love, I'm going to keep chipping away. And I just want to acknowledge the courageous warrior spirit Mm -hmm. that you have within you that has allowed the rest of us to find that within ourselves through the wake of your creation. Mm -hmm. And whether it be a social media platform, becoming the one, the book, the online program, um, and your writings on your website and everything else that you've created um, is an opportunity for all of us to come home into our own unique ways. Um, and I just wanted to also acknowledge there was a post that you made recently that really was super special and um, I noticed because you have two Instagram accounts you have your personal one where you're a little bit more visible on it and then Mm -hmm. there's the um, the rising woman which is um, a little bit more like quotes and 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 wisdom and guidance but it's not necessarily about you Mm -hmm. Um, however you did share a photo of yourself and you the caption that went along with it was so deeply heartfelt 
and um, vulnerable and also liberating Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I think we can get so lost behind veneers and filters that we create um, this perception of like pedestaling people that have created or founded success in the 3D. Um, But this post sort of shattered that illusion that could have been may have been created into the sense of um your relationship with uh with your height mm-hmm. and so i'd love to sh- just to really hear a little bit more about um your relationship with claiming and owning the wholeness mm-hmm. of who you are mm-hmm. and no longer needing to go by the narrative of other people that say um oh, well, maybe you're less than or men like certain height or certain, you know, um, that that can create essentially like shrapnel of unworthiness. And I just love to hear a little bit about your journey Mm -hmm. around that piece. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was actually really hard for me to share that post, which is interesting because, you know, generally I don't share something until I feel like I've fully integrated it. You know, I'm really a believer in containment and practicing alchemy. So if I haven't integrated it, then I'm not going to share it yet because there's still medicine happening. Um, but with this particular part of my being, it it's just felt tender. And I just haven't felt like it's fully integrated. And I was like, you know, I think part of the integration in this case is actually sharing and resonating, you know, just being out there with you know what I'm experiencing and you know so I'm four nine I'm a very tiny woman and when I was really young my mom's the same height as me and she would always be obsessed with my height and she would always tell me that like I needed to be five five in order to you know be good in the world and she was always like taking me to doctors and like hoping that I would be tall and So it was very much conditioning as well. Because like I talked to some people who, you know, their whole family is short and nobody has a problem with it. But a lot of it was, you know, me being in an environment where I was constantly being fed this idea that my size was a problem. Um, And then I remember when I was 16 and I had just gotten out of the shower and I was brushing my hair and I was looking in the mirror and I heard my mom say to my boyfriend, oh, Shalina would be so beautiful if she was 5'5". And he was like, yeah, totally. And I remember my heart sank and I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not beautiful. Oh, like I thought I could be beautiful, but I guess I can't. And it it sounds so crazy to think that, you know, something like that could just tell a person that they, they're not beautiful and that they would believe it. But you know, when you come from the kind of trauma that I came from, you don't have much of a center yet. And you're just a 16 year old girl. Um, that kind of information coming from your mother can really land. And so for me, I was like, Oh, I can't be beautiful because I'm short. And so, you know, throughout my life, I've had all sorts of, you know, I've been called every name and and been judged. And I've had people tell me that, you know, I can't be successful and like a lot of hurtful things. Um, But really, it's just been about me really claiming who I am and being in my body and even just knowing, you know, I, I, when you say you're, you're a forest fairy, I'm like, I really feel like that too. Like I'm this like tiny little forest fairy that just like belongs in the trees. Um, And so, yeah, it's been interesting for me to exist in a world where I don't really fit properly. (laughs) Like nothing is really built for me, literally, you know, like I can't reach almost anything. I have to ask for help all of the time. Um, One percent of the time I can find clothing that fits me without having to have it altered. So it's like a whole thing to try to find clothing. Um, Just driving like all the things you know it's all it's different for me um but at the same time it's funny because i you know online you can't see a person's size and so i'll get a lot of projections and people will say oh like i bet you have a hot girl complex or i bet you're you know you think you're better than people because you're so pretty and 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 it would stun me because i don't feel that about myself and then i'm getting these reflections and i had a friend say that to me and i said do you know how many times I've been, you know, called derogative names because of my size? So it's really weird for me to hear that people think that, you know, I could think that I'm better than them because of how I look. Um, but that's just a perception, right? It's just like the world that we live in. Um, so it's been a real invitation for me. I remember Clarissa Pinkle Estes, she talked about body image in, in her book and she had some quote about, you know, how, you know, sh- you know, short women or we're on stilts and tall women were hunched over and like all, all of us just trying to contort ourselves essentially um, to be something other than w- what we are. And so it's been really liberating for me to just claim 
who I am and to be also really open, you know, with other people about how it feels as a small person in the world to be, you know, talked about as if I'm half a person or not equal because of that. Cause like, that's kind of, you know, people say, oh, well, you're, you only count as half a person. You know, people say that to me, even people who are my friends. And I was like, it doesn't really feel good to, to hear that. Um, and I was amazed at the outpouring. Like I have written so many things and I've shared so many vulnerable stories and that post for a week after I was receiving emails, private messages, people, women who owned companies that I was, you know, affiliated with were emailing me their stories. Like everyone was just like, Hey, that really resonated with me. And it was really tall women and really short women who were just like, I feel you, you know? And it just reminded me that, you know, if we're not considered whatever it is average in the world, then it, it can be tough to exist. And I think when we share our stories and we sort of bust the myth that we, we feel better than or that you know we have it all together it, it just creates a space for us all to be a little bit more whole mm. yeah oh, it's mm -hmm. it's good madison mm -hmm. it's the it's the it's the jenny of artificial glamour to authentic beauty yeah i think that what makes somebody so beautiful is the authentic genuine caring nurturing loving compassionate integrity that is what makes someone beautiful mm -hmm. truly uh as opposed to oh i need longer hair or bigger eyelashes or bigger boobs because then you will accept me based off of society's expectation now i don't think that there's anything per se wrong with that it's more yeah. so just can we love ourselves so that it oozes over mm -hmm. and then everything just starts getting a little bit more twinkly and brighter whether we're three foot tall mm -hmm. or you know nine foot tall I don't know, <laughs> you know like it's pretty tall but um <laughs> more so it, it, it I find that the the magnetism is of, of the the capacity of how much one can love yeah absolutely I, I fully agree I feel that beauty is an energy but it's funny how sometimes we know these things, but then with our own conditioning, we struggle to extend that to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but I truly see people's energy in their hearts. Like I've literally sat in front of someone who was a GQ model and I didn't register that they were attractive until I knew them. And it's it's like, it's actually like that for me. Like, I don't know, uh, my girlfriends will be like, oh, that person's so attractive. And I'm like, oh, really? Like, who are they and what are they about? Like, mm -hmm. how do you know until you really know a person's heart, yeah. you know? Well, I've got an opportunity today to mm -hmm. get to fill your heart mm -hmm. um, beyond the world of social media. Um, but I, I think also through Instagram stories, you can get a feel for mm -hmm. someone's energy and, and just the choice of what they choose to place out into the world, what frequency they choose to place out. And so that's, that's created the magnetism between us connecting today. But now being able to actually sit down with you, get to connect mm -hmm. with Ben and Bodhi mm -hmm. and, and you in person and to hear your stories and to hear your wisdom and then to be able to hold in my hands a body of work that has been birthed over a lifetime and many lifetimes of, of wisdom and, and breakdowns leading to breakthroughs is truly an honor. So I'm just so grateful for you being on the podcast today and, um, and for sharing yourself in such a vulnerable way. It is a, truly a breath of fresh air. So I have one final question for you. I ask all of my guests, sometimes they feel like I'm putting them on the spot. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, if your microphone was connected mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. all media outlets in the whole world and you were going to be blasted all over the, the news <laughs> and um, the radio stations and you had 30 seconds to deliver a message to humanity. What would you say? Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's so tough because I'm like, there's so many things that I want to share. <laughs> I, th I think I have two. One of them would just be to invite people to remember the power that their bodies hold to birth life in this world in a very sacred way mm. and that they don't need to be afraid of life or death that they're here they're made for this mm. and the other would be to love your children so fiercely with such an open heart and to remember that at the end like family is all there is like we leave with nothing else but the love in our hearts and the lessons in our souls it's just carrying that with us yeah <laughs> so good. All right. So, how can we get this actual microphone to plug into the thing? We need to get this picture now. Now. 
ASAP. <laughs> well, thank you from the bottom and every corner of my heart for you being here, offering your greatest gift you can ever give anybody, which is your time and your presence. Um, and for me being able to snap you up mm. while you're in Los Angeles <laughs> and rinse you of all of your wisdom on my podcast. Um, so that introduce you to the bluebirds. And for all of those that are listening that haven't yet been able to tune in um, with your social media or where you're at would you mind just um, letting us all know how we can find you yeah. through social media and all of your website and all the things yes so my instagram handle is at shalina ayana and that's probably gonna be hard to spell i'm assuming it will be listed on your site and then also at rising woman and then um, i have risingwoman.com and my new website will be up soon it's yeah. shalinaayana.com but you have meditations and things like that you can download there oh, incredible that's where most of my work is ho- housed and with all of that being said, of course, is th- this is available now, right? So my book is available for pre-order um, and it's going to be ready to buy in stores and everywhere online on April 12th, 2022. Ah, yeah. perfect. Yeah, so it's coming, but you can pre-order it uh, and it will be in your hands very soon, I hope. I'm really excited. Incredible. Yeah. So do yourself a favor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you, I, I, you know that I don't talk about anything that I don't believe in um that i don't Mm -hmm. think that will become medicine for your own personal experience and this is just something that even just scanning through it being able to meet you in person and simultaneously everything that you've created up until this point there's just such a deep strong resonance and i felt when i opened it earlier and i was reading through um the rejection um patterns and i just felt finally i have words to an emotion that i couldn't put into words and i also in my hands have action steps um and intimacy uh um ways of sort of um things that i can incorporate into my relationship that can create a deeper level of intimacy and there's there's action steps here so this is just priceless and um not only does it feel really good to be able to receive this wisdom but it also feels really good to support you mm-hmm. And your mission and your message in the world of, of supporting the feminine rising on the planet and reconnecting us to our emotions and our feelings and our navigation around this very weird human experience that we've all got plopped into. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's very what strange. What is going on? <laughs> oh, got it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as many folks would like that that do that yeah. yes yeah. um and so becoming the one is available for pre-order so go check it out the all of the information will be in the show notes on youtube as well as um, the podcasting platforms for through audio and if you resonate with this podcast today then please um tag us both and on your instagram stories and share it share it far and wide because you're going to be able to touch people that we are not necessarily going to be able to share and touch but if there's anything that has stood out to you as a piece of um empowerment or a different lens a different way of seeing something then then please share the medicine with the world um, and definitely get your hands on this book. I am so excited to read this and, com- and finish it and ultimately receive the benefits of all of the wisdom that's been shared and incorporate it and integrate it into my life to become the one for myself. Oh, thank you so much, sister. It's such a gift. Thank so you great. so much for your work. Oh. <laughs> all righty, beautiful humans. Until next time, thank you so much for tuning in to Deja Blue podcast. Thank you for being here on this journey with us. And remember, if you are a bluebird, that means that you are here to spread beauty, love, and unity on the planet. So much gratitude and so much appreciation. Until next week, blast, blast.